two material objections are to be answered, and then I shall proceed. The first is, if sin be in the regenerate yet covered and not imputed, how will this stand with the omnisciency, truth, and holiness of God? His omnisciency, for he cannot but see sin if it be there. His truth, for God must needs judge of things as they are. If therefore sin be there, he must judge it to be there. Otherwise we make him like the wicked who covers sin. He will not acknowledge it to be there. Now, what truth is this to say of a regenerate man, he is cleansed and washed from all this evil, and yet his evil is in him? This the learned among the papists do much urge. Perarius, Tiernus, etc., as most, saith Suarez de Justifique, it makes remission of sin to be nothing but a remission of the punishment, not of the offense or fault. The very same is urged by antinomists. Lastly, how do they consist with God's holiness? For he must needs hate sin in whomsoever he finds it, and therefore for the saints to have sin in them, and yet God not to impute it to them, seemeth a contradiction. But to all this the answer is easy. As for God's omnisciency, none say, but by that God beholds sin where it is, and in that sense sin is not at all said to be covered, for he knoweth all in man. As for his truth, God doth judge as the thing is, for as he seeth sin, so he judges the sin to be in them, according to that eternal rule laid down, Psalm 89, verses 32 and 33. He chastiseth them with the rod, though he take not his loving kindness from them, so that God doth not judge things otherwise than they are. And as for his holiness, he is not only angry with their sins, but also would proceed to their eternal condemnation, were it not for Christ their surety so that their sins are punished, though not in their own persons, neither is this a taking away of sin only in respect of the punishment, but of the offense also. God being holy, reconciled with his people, though the corruption, which is removed by sanctification, not justification, is by degrees purged away. The second objection is, how can God see sin, seeing they have Christ's righteousness, and, there being no sin in that, therefore God must look upon them as in Christ, which is without any sin at all. The answer is, that when we say Christ's righteousness is made theirs, it is not to be understood subjectively, as if it were a quality inherent in them, for then indeed God could not see sin in them. But relatively, he is their mediator, and by his obedience they are acquitted, so that the righteousness is in Christ, but by faith it becomes theirs, not formally, but as the merit for which God doth justify them, and God doth account it to them as theirs. Now this is no contradiction, to be sinful in ourselves, and yet at the same time acquitted by the righteousness of another. It is true, those expressions of making Christ's righteousness a formal righteousness, or, as others, a material righteousness, and those disputations, whether Christ's active or passive obedience, both or either of them be imputed to us, hath much darkened the question, Whereas if we consider of it as a relative righteousness performed by our surety in our stead, the matter will be made much clearer. Yet I speak not this, as if Christ's act of obedience were not made ours, as in time may be showed. I come to the second observation out of the text, which is, that those only do esteem pardon of sin as a blessedness, who feed inwardly the anger of God for sin. David here in this psalm, being deeply wounded with the guilt of his sin, judgeth not his kingdom, his wealth, his conquest over enemies, and happy thing, but pardon of sin. Now the ground of this, because such is our custom, though it be our, though it be our weakness, excuse me, to esteem of mercies more carendo quam habendo, by wanting of them, than having of them, the blind man earnestly desireth sight. The lame man prizeth sound limbs. A people distressed with war, and finding the bitterness of it, command peace. Thus it is here, a man afflicted and embittered in his soul because of sin. He doth highly admire forgiveness, and accounts those happy that walk in the sense of God's favor. Though innocency or freedom from sin may be magus beneficium, a greater mercy than pardon and reparation, yet this is dulcius beneficium, a more sweet mercy to the sense and feeling of him who enjoyeth it. Hence that Christ and the gospel might be exalted, God permitteth sin to be, and the law is on purpose to discover sin and aggravate it, that Christ and his grace may be the more welcome. The uses of both points together are number one, from the former. Doth God in pardoning cover sin? Then with what boldness may true faith triumph? 
Why is the godly penitent as if his sins are always in bloody characters before God? Why is he as if there were no blood of Christ wherein these Egyptians are drowned? If thou hadst never been a sinner, thy heart would not have trembled. Is not forgiveness making of a sin not to be, as you have heard? So that as Rachel is mourning for her children, because they are not, so mayest thou be rejoicing, because thy sins are not. And although they be not covered out of thy sight, yet if covered out of God's sight, that is thy blessedness. Better have them rise up always in thy conscience than once before God. From the second we may be instructed, who are the best preachers of Christ in the grace of the gospel who are gospel preachers. Even such who make deep incisions and wounds first in men's conscience by the law. The only way for a minister to make his auditors relish and favor, uh, relish and savor, excuse me, of Christ and grace indeed, is to keep them in a godly sense and apprehension of their infirmities. We are not in our first conversion only to have throbs and pangs after God's grace, but also this hunger and thirsting after Christ is to be kept up in the progress of sanctification. And therefore, as those ministers are to be blamed, if any such, that do only press duty, discover sin, but never set forth the fullness of Christ, so they also are to be blamed, who only press such texts as manifest God's grace, but never open that issue and fountain of all the filth that is within us. Both these, tempered together, are like Aaron's excellent compound, the last use of exhortation is to be so deeply humbled and tenderly affected within yourselves that all within you may cry out, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth no sin. O oh, that every auditor which heareth me this day could with the same spirit, affection, and turning of bowels within him proclaim this truth as David did. What is said of Paul's epistles is also true of David's psalm. Nunquam Davidus mentem in Telegis, Nisai, Prius, Davidus, Spiritum, Imbiberus. You can never fully understand Dave. You can never fully understand David's meaning unless you be possessed with David's spirit. Now that you may be moved hereunto, consider the motive in the text and the means to get it. The motive is blessedness. A man is never a happy man till his sins be pardoned. What makes hell and damnation but merely not forgiveness? Thy wealth, thy greatness, thy honors cannot bring that happiness to thee, which remission of sins doth. Hence this is the cause of all other blessedness. And observe here, excuse me, and observe, here is a great deal of difference between this place, blessed is the man whose sins are pardoned, and those texts where he is said to be blessed that feareth always, or he is said to be blessed that walketh not in the ways of the wicked. For in the text is showed the cause or fountain of blessedness, that is, remission of sin. But in other places there is only deciphered who they are that are blessed. A man that feareth is blessed, but his fear is not the cause of his blessedness. A man that liveth godly is blessed, but his godliness is not the cause of his blessedness. But his pardon of sin makes him blessed in all his grace. Thou art blessed, not because thou prayest, hearest, livest holily, but because God doth forgive all thy sins and imperfections in these duties. If therefore your graces, your holy duties, are not the cause of your blessedness, never think your outward mercies can be. The means to obtain this is in the text, by having no guile in the heart, that is, by not hiding our sins, but repenting of them and confessing them to God. For this, saith David, every one shall pray unto thee in an acceptable time. For this, that is, for this remission, and because thou wast so ready to forgive, when I said, I will confess my sin, therefore shall every one seek to thee. Where, by the way, let none abuse that place. Verse 5, David said, he would confess, and God forgave it. David did but say it, and God pardoned it. So some have descanted upon it. But to say there, according to the use of the Hebrew word in some places, is firmly to propose and decree so resolvedly, that he will be diligent in the practice of it. Do not therefore think that a mere lip labor is that brokenness and contrition of spirit which God requireth as the means to pardon.